back at it. Good goo. So this week we want to talk about uh, you personally. Oh, a that bit. one. That's going to be a big one. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling it's going to be something that is going to be just important to give perspective to maybe the way you think, the way you work, the way everything. Yeah, I guess for people can know a little. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of people that go like, I knew it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, when did you come to the realization that you maybe fell somewhere along the autism spectrum? When I accepted it as a fact or when I kind of really wondered? Because, I mean, for as far as I remember, I was like, I'm different. I don't know what it is, but I'm not thinking the way they do. Mm-hmm. Like, that's me in school. Like, that's me kindergarten, stuff like that. Um, I always knew. I couldn't put a finger on it. I remember in my 20s, early 20s, going like, I think I must be autistic on certain behavior. I was like, I don't, I think this, and we were like, nah, because, you know, autism is, uh, yeah. right, and all that stuff. So there was, no, 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 like, what are you talking about? You're completely normal. I'm like, I don't think it's a disease. So I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. And that's, the problem is a label. Yes. Right, so before we go personal, let's go at the technical aspect so I can explain, because I think people misunderstand autism. Uh, I mean, I don't think I know Definitely. that for a fact. So let's go first of all what it is. So there is something out there called the uh, imprinted brain theory. That's where that stuff goes over there. And it was from it's uh, evolutionary biology, right? And he was explaining that autism is a not exactly, but let me paraphrase um, like a set of genes that we have, if you want. Like it's a behavior pattern, just like. Uh, what is, uh, schizophrenia is a behavior pattern, right? So the idea, for example, the problem with uh, schizophrenia is that schizophrenia is the uh, dysfunctional part of a very specific behavior type. It's called a schizotype, uh, schizotypal behavior. That's the one right there, right? Which is a, uh, a behavior that is not necessarily dysfunctional, that, that has its reasons to be. So what do I mean by that? So the imprinted brain theory was schizotypal behavior versus autistic behavior, and to go at it from an evolutionary biology perspective, from an evolution perspective. So let's look at evolution even of the human society, right? You have 10,000 years ago, Neolithic village, 150 people. You have to build walls because there's predators left and right whose job is to eat you, right? And so life in such a village is very specific, right? And that's where... um, most people are were called a schizotypal type, so in a dysfunctional way would be schizophrenia. What does that mean? For example, you have paranoia, right? A paranoiac behavior that's associated with uh, schizophrenia, for example, it can be dysfunctional. But if you live in a neolithic village where there's 13 predators out there trying to kill you. It's keeping you alive. It's keeping you alive. Yeah. If that branch is moving, you better think something is out to get you because most likely something is. Mm-hmm. So that's what made people make the joke. I might be uh, paranoia, but doesn't mean they're not after me. Yeah. It's very true because that's what paranoia becomes in the way we look at it is a dysfunctional behavior. Like everybody's trying to kill me. No, but in that fucking village, everybody is. Yeah. Not your people, but everybody else is. So you need the paranoia to survive, right? For example, women versus men. Promiscuity, which is schizophrenia people, we know it, they're associated with a sexual behavior toward promiscuity, is very necessary. Why? Because your mate is most likely going to die. Yeah. Right? Uh, life expectancy is much lower because this shit happens, right? So that means, like, let's say for women and the men, she has to be attached to his position in a tribe more than the person itself, right? Because he dies, the next one comes in. You don't have, you can mourn, but your kids need to feed, or you need to have kids, or you need someone positioned like, da, 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 right? So it's going to, and for the many, it's going to pro, uh, promote a promiscuous behavior because they need to spread their seed more, right? So for a woman, for example, needs kids that take less time out of her. So she needs kids that are very independent, that are just going to f- go fuck around and everything, right? Yeah. It's a world where you need the entire world and has to be part of who you are so you can integrate in what you do, go all over the place. So that's a very schizophrenic type behavior Mm -hmm. where they think the entire world is them. In that world, that behavior is necessary, not in a dysfunctional way, but actually in that case, a functional way, right? So you see, for example, like kids... The, like the quick, glossy version of that behavior. Yes. Not the obsessive... Exactly. Not the, not the dysfunctional one, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you see, for example, like a kid that requires a lot of attention out of you will be detrimental in such a behavior. You need to have more kids, so 
more like chances of survival. They don't need to have too much to ask from you because you have so many kids to take care of. And the, the behavior starts to be established like that. And that's more if you start to see a non-dysfunctional schizophrenia, that's what basically the behavior you would see. So those are the basically the behavior associated with specific set of genes, we think, that would be very beneficial in a Neolithic village. Right. So now you move on to a world that has 7 billion people, or at least the Western world, right, which is, what, 3 billion people? In that world, there is no more predators, first of all. We eliminated all of them. So now you're in a place where you don't need to hide and freeze 10 times a day where you're like, don't make a noise. There's a bear outside, mm -hmm. right? You don't need that freeze behavior, right? You need to basically be able to do more. So in a world like that, first of all, uh, socialization will be very different. There's no need for promiscuous behavior from a sexual uh, perspective because uh, there's so many people, first of all, we're not rebuilding after the flood. It's a different idea, right? And on top of it, like, you can start to, you're going to look for, you have more choices, you're going to start to be more discriminatory, and you're going to find that one person that you want to spend your life with, not based so much on their position, but more on who they are, da, da, da. so basically what you see with a lot of the autistic sexual behavior is they made for life. Mm -hmm. They find one person and they stay forever because in that case, that sexual behavior is more suited for life in society. What is, so in a Neolithic village, you conquer by being strong, killing predators, killing who, ahead of the village, stuff like that. In today's world, that's gone because there's no predators or anything. So how do you dominate? The only competition is other human beings, first of all, right? So how do you dominate them? By being fucking good at one thing. So instead of the multitasker, Back then, that has to be, you know, integrate the entire world yeah. into who he is so he can multitask and everything. You have one person that is going to block everything else but one thing. And being awesome at that one thing, we allow him to dominate his field, which allows him to go up in society status, basically. Via specialization. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, ultra specialist. And if you look, that's what autistic behavior is. It's people that go toward one thing and one thing only and get fucking good at it. The fact that you're only made for life gives you more time to work toward that one thing that you're going to do perfectly. You need less socialization so you can be good at just that one thing. You need less freeze button so you can be better at that one thing. So if you look in that sense, right, in that behavior, it would be a way of hyper specialization, which is needed for this society. That's why you see Google hiring more and more autistic kids because they're fucking good yeah. at one thing but allows them to be the best they can be at that thing. Because that's now where the society takes us. It's a different set of behavior. So the imprinted brain theory was looking at autism not like a neurological problem, because we look at it for uh, not the high functioning aut autistic uh, kids. We look at the ones that are dysfunctional, yeah. where they cannot function. And, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean not being able to function in society, yeah. right? And a lot of it has to do because we're looking at it the incorrect way, right? But the idea was that, so in that sense, Autism is a step forward in evolution based on the society we live in. And the further we go into the society, the way it's being created right now, the more autistic we're gonna have to be in order to excel. And the schizotypal behavior is gonna be left at the bottom. It's interesting because the types of, like when you talk about specialization now, is because our world has become so broad and diverse from technologically and all we, those other just, things, it's that it's fucking impossible to be good at many things, hardly anyways. Anymore. That's why when people say you can be anything, uh, you can be everything. It's like, no, that's not true. You yeah. can be anything, yeah. but you can't be everything. That yeah. is just not true. If you look all the documentaries on the chefs and everything, they do one thing, like the Ramen Heads documentary is such a fascinating stuff. The guy does ramen noodle. That's all he does. But he's amazing at it. But yeah, that's I, what it takes. I used to do the shit out of ramen noodles. Yeah. Oh, Maybe yeah. The dude is like... Uh, I don't based. think... I think he and I did very different ramen noodles. Probably. Uh, trust me. Watch <laughs> the documentary he did. But so, the key is if you want, like, it's very interesting to uh, look at autism and, and the behavior of autism, because autism is a label. Yeah. The problem is the spectrum is so wide, we don't even understand what it means. 60% of people are undiagnosed, like me, and high-functioning... How would you know if you're high-functioning uh, autistic like me, you how would you You probably know? don't know until you're in your 40s that you had it. Exactly. Right. So because it's, it's a set of behavior. It's a way that your nervous system works at solving problems right? yeah. in today's society. That's all this is. So it seems like it's a set of genes being activated based on... So society, uh, evolution works, it has a structure, and it has leeway on top to adapt to whatever it is. So the structure is exactly the same, it's just the leeway on top 
allows you to go more one way or another, behavior-wise, to dominate in your society? Now, my interpretation of evolution is as a, simply as, as a matter of like optimizing reproduction. Like I always thought that that was the, the mechanism with which evolution mm -hmm. made these steps, right? Was that this trait fell, fell here exactly. and it makes this way easier for this person so to mate. So how would you... It, it sounds yeah. almost the way you're describing it, like it's almost proactive though. It's a, uh, to me, evolution is like a much stronger alpha zero. Okay. It's a learning it's a mechanism. But there's always randomness. The so if you look, there, there's an intent in society, which is to become more or, or organized, okay. right? Is to create more order. Yeah. That's the intent of society. If you look, we start with a small number, we've grown, and we get more and more and more organized into what we do. So That's we manage social the classes. volume. And yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And now we have social classes that work for a certain amount of people. But now that the number is so large, it doesn't work anymore. So now we're creating another system. Yeah. We're going, globalization is what? We're moving toward a planetary government. Instead because the fragmented the pieces doesn't everywhere. work anymore yeah. because you have too many wars. So now there's too many people. So now we're moving toward a planetary government because that's what society does. It's like a, it's going to be a massive end farm, basically. So, so we're moving toward that. So an evolution for, for, so it's life, basically, that evolves like that. And evolution follows that pattern. So is, there's always a structure to it, but there's also ways for the, like an alpha zero, to try better ways to solve a problem. And so randomness is a huge part of that. And if you look right now, it looks like uh, evolution is playing games with autism in a way to see like, okay, what works, right? Yeah. You notice that the rise of autism is much higher in uh, first world country than mm -hmm. say third world countries. Like if, if you look at the kind of behavior I'm talking about for autism, look at the Japanese culture. The most organized culture there ever was since the 14th century. It's a m no higher numbers of people in a smaller city, right? most organized culture ever, because there were so many people. But look how hyper-specialist they were from the beginning. Look at the mating for life. Look at the, there's so many patterns of behavior you find in a Japanese culture that you could easily associate with certain, uh, certain uh, behavior patterns that you see in autism. Not the, uh, the dysfunctional autism for society, the ones that are actually the high functioning autistic, yeah. that people like me, basically. But that's, I would do just fine in a, in a certain, in uh, Japan, let's say, like 200 years ago, in the, <laughs> unless you're a farmer, but that's another problem, um, in a, such an organized society, because they would have given me one thing to be good at, and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to do that. Like, that's martial arts, that's all I would do. Yeah. I mean, I do one thing, and that's all I do. And it's 24-7, my brain works toward one thing. And culturally, too, there, there's a, there is a real emphasis on mastery. Yes. Like that's, it's the Japanese it's, culture. It's that's revered. All, it's revealed. If you're the best sword maker, if you're the best at One this, thing. And yeah. you're going to do apprenticeship and your whole life is going to be about doing one thing. It's like that sushi chef, mm -hmm. 65 years, every day comes to work and he can't wait to get better at it at a level which it's mind boggling. But I understand that because that's yeah. all I do. So there was a very interesting aspect about that. And that's really what allowed me to understand. Because yeah. I was like, when I started reading that, I was like, this is my behavior. Like literally, they posted certain behaviors, like, oh, I understand better. Now, there was a lot of moments where I knew, but I was like, there's no label to it. I didn't like the label autistic, because yeah. like everybody else, I thought, I looked at it Because it seemed like it was on or off, too. Yeah. It seemed like in the and beginning. Plus, I'm, I'm super high functioning, because I was like, I have no problem in society. But that's not true. Like, I have no problem in socializations. That's not true. I... It's just not comfortable for me to do, but I do it anyway. But that's, so, I mean, there's certain things like that where I never truly put the finger on it. I was like, I know I'm different. Mm -hmm. and, but how do you know, by the way, you're different since, to you, you're completely every, normal. Well, yeah. but, but everyone also still feels unique as a person. Exactly. So, so there's a point where you're like, well, I am me. Is that that's just all. the way me? Exactly. And so that's yeah. the way I looked at it. It's like, but everybody's different. So I'm just not more different than others. I'm just different, but just like they're all different. That wasn't true either. Right, so that's where you, because you want your, you want to see yourself as a snowflake always, but mm -hmm. at the same time, sometimes you actually are different. When and was so, when? So when was your like light bulb moment where you were like, "Fuck"? That was uh, maybe a month ago. Like whenever I think it was like a few days before I made that post on Instagram, mm -hmm. where reading the, um, there was two moments. The first one I really chipped was I was I, I took Yaya to see the, the new Predator movie. 
and the kid in it is autistic, but uh, with problems and, every, uh, and but he's like, she kept saying it was the next step in evolution. And this is something I've been looking into it from the nervous system. I um, knew it was a fucking predator. Yeah, I always, right? Um, <laughs> but looking at from uh, that perspective, I was like, okay, so it's an evolution thing. And I was just reading about the schizotypal sexual behavior versus the autistic sexual behavior. And I was like, and then I just kept referring back to the, not symptoms, but behavior that just fit mine. And then when I read the, imp I was like, okay, what if I'm, I'm that? And then I looked, when I read the imprinted brain, uh, uh, imprinted brain theory, that's when you just, it, I was like, oh, come on. But when I was 20, I was talking about it. I knew I just couldn't like say it out loud, if you want. Yeah. But there was also other moments because my, um, that's more on the, but so now we can go into the personal stuff, right? So when my daughter was in school, when she was five, she went to uh, kindergarten and she had issues there learning. That wasn't her fault, actually. The key is she didn't go to preschool, so in the States, that's a huge mistake. But mm -hmm. me coming from France, you don't put your kid in preschool. Yeah. So she goes there and she's expected to read. I was like, fuck me. Seems like a bold, bold expectation. But when she was in Palos Verdes, there was some kid showing up at kindergarten reading Harry Potter because the moms are so fucking insane yeah. that they, they shine through their kids in kindergarten. It is the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. Is those women bringing their kids to kindergarten was the biggest competition I've ever seen. They, that, that to this day boggles my mind that you would do this to kids. But anyway, so she gets there and she's lost, right? And so they want to do a test and then they diagnose her with learning disability. So uh, first of all, that's where parenting starts, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> the little story. Um, I'm asking to come with the main teacher and the principal about Yaya not doing well at school. I walk in and there's eight women, speech therapists, psychologists, and he goes on and on like that. And I basically got ambushed. Well, they pounded me for an hour and a half saying like, uh, your daughter is basically like incapable of learning that, 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 we need to test her. I was like, whoa, 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 just because she doesn't know her home address because I didn't teach her doesn't mean you get to blame that on her. But welcome to the American system at the mm -hmm. time, and that's the way. And so they test her and then they put it on uh, your uh, learning disability, which isn't true. Because uh, basically I was like, I never had a panic attack in my life until the second meeting like that. These five women just blasting me from an hour and a half telling me, basically trying to bully me into agreeing to put her into their uh, learning center with kids with Down syndrome and everything. I was like, are you, did you say my daughter is retarded? Like, uh, it, but like, in, in, so they, they're putting her in, in a place where um, they can't help her because I learn after. That's because they didn't have a learning center. Mm -hmm. So instead of telling me that and putting her in a school that had a learning center, instead of that, they kept her in that school and put her with kids that had Down syndrome and basically, you know, IQs in the 50s and stuff like that. Where her problem was never intelligence. It was comprehension because if you put her in a class with 30 kids, the stimulus becomes too much. Exactly. If you put her a group of 10, she was fine. And, and, and even removing the, obviously, like the parenting stress from that, when you describe being in a room full of eight people coming at you like that, you said that's like your first like big panic attack. I never, I never freaked out. Like, I'm in the yeah. car and I'm shaking, yeah. uh, probably crying. I've never had my system shut down on me like it did. Yeah. And I was like, oh, is that what the panic attack feels like? No, no, it was my entire system shutting off. I just didn't understand what it was back then. What, what was it? It was the repetition of negative stimulus. Mm -hmm. That's what gets me. Just feedback, noise. Boom. Yeah, yeah, so now I can, so let's, let's explain exactly what it feels like, uh, what this is on a personal level, like the, not the problems, but the downside, right? So yeah. in, most people imagine like you're living in a room like this that has glass walls and open windows. So any, any noise, is kind of dimmed, right? You don't yeah. really hear the noise. Well, you hear the noises, but they're not very loud, right? Any light is uh, not that bright, right? And so if sound comes from the outside, it kind of gets drowned within your own stuff. It, you, you know, things like this, right? I, I live in a room that is where the walls are extremely thick that has no windows. That means that any light, any sound is extremely loud. So. It allows me to hear any sound, to see any light. So once you learn to, to live with this, you can compose a symphony out of light and sound, like your own symphony. So I'm constantly hearing music, mm -hmm. my own music. Because you're so 
tuned into that. You're so tuned that. in. So imagine the complexity. And it's a music you don't even hear with your ears. It's you hear with your nervous system. You hear with your nerves. You hear you hear it inside. That has symphony playing constantly inside that allows me to. It's I'll never be able to explain how beautiful it is on a normal basis. Which means that's why you'll see me stare in the in the open or being on my own and everything because I'm listening to the music, but not even with my ears, like with my entire body. So I, I'll just, I don't know, it's, it's being on the ship. I mean, like mm -hmm. it's, uh, imagine if you're on a, on a river, right? You're not moving, but you feel yourself moving all the time. All right, so it's a little bit like that. I'm yeah. constantly on the boat, feeling myself going down the river where everything is constantly moving. I have sensation continuously, right? So that's, and I can compose in symphony because I can feel all the, the texture and then the, the subtleties of this and this and this. And so it's, I'll, I'll never describe how beautiful it feels. And that's what I get when I get to do one thing and I get to get really good at it. And I get into that thing and me, we get into a flow and it's literally being going down the river on a smooth ride. And it's, and it's, that's, that's basically what it feels like. Right? So that room is so bright, so loud, right? So if you introduce your music into mine, if you introduce light or sound, that does not mix with mine, then it becomes extremely aggressive. It's a grenade going off while I listen to music, and that can be extremely aggressive for me. So it puts me into the <gasps> that state, and that's why it felt like that day. So that happens through repetition of negative stimulus. Like the first bomb that comes in, I'm okay. But the second or third, now you, now you stress me out at a level where I shouldn't be that stress inside. But you disrupted the music, you made it so, it's physically painful suddenly inside where forced socialization, for example, become physically painful. Like I'll start sweating, like, you know, uh, super like acidic. Yeah. I'll, I'll have physical reactions to something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be that bad. But that's because to me it is because it is that loud. It's just not that loud to you, yeah. but it is to me. And so it becomes extremely stressful. And that's what you see with the freak outs is just the, the, the stress level becomes uh, like, like it's stupid, but like I was looking for a credit card, right? It's on my um, it's on my desk, and I found the first one, and I can't find the second one, and that's what the, so the repetition of that stress started to get me. I had to shut off all music and ask Yaya not to talk to me until I found the second card because suddenly I could not look for the card, like literally on my desk, which it has to be there because I know it's there. I couldn't look for it until I shut off all music and shut off all sensation coming in because the repetition of the negative stimulus was too much for me. And so suddenly I'm like, I'm like this and I had to shut everything and I'm with the card. And once I found the card, it was okay. Yeah. But th that, so that's a level of stress that there is no reason for, right? And so that's what got me growing up and up to that realization is like certain things were hitting me. I was like, why are you so sensitive to certain things? It's like emotionally I never uh, evolved by, past 16. Everything just hits me like a, uh, you know, a wall of bricks const constantly and I was like, why am I having such a strong reaction to something that is not that big of a deal, right? And so that stimulus like that is very, very hard to take, right? And so yeah. the worst thing you do for autistic kids basically is not allowing them to do one thing all day because you're taking them away from what they're made for and you make them do different things, which means they never excel anything, which means the music is always an aggression, right? Yeah. And then the forced socialization is the worst thing. When I'm making me deal with people I don't want, don't want to, puts a bomb into my own room and that makes it very, very painful sometimes. And so I've learned to put facades and I've learned especially behavior. So I've learned to pretend when I have certain social situation, I've learned to behave a certain way. So I have certain scenarios for certain things. So when that, scenario, when that particular situation happened, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And that's why you'll see me doing the same way. Yeah. It's because that's a scenario I go through. That's, an, that's a pattern that I establish because I know in that situation, if I act like that, I'm okay. And so I'll do that and you'll see me act exactly the same way over and over and again because that's my defense mechanism to deal with situations because I don't know how to do it. What was that like for you? I, well, let's just say now. Like, like is, what's that like for you socially or with like human interaction and things like that. Is that something you're always having to make sure that you're prepared to have an exit a little bit? A little bit? It's like, not an exit, but it's like um, this. What, what I'm learning to do is to stop always uh, putting a facade, like to, that it's okay to talk to people and everything. It's just like, uh, like for example, when I did the, uh, um, 
the sensitivity of it is always great. Like when I made a post about autism, like I, I was shaking for two days. It's just stuff that, imagine a 12 year old in a 45 year old body, basically, it's, it feels a lot like that. So um, when I go talk to someone I don't know, it's like the jitters of a kid. Mm -hmm. You've seen like kids when they talk to adults say like this, that's a bit, little bit how I feel. So I have to go like, hey, my name is, I have to remind myself I'm an adult and then just behave as such. And so there's a, but there's always a gap between how I act and how it feels with people I don't know. So yeah. it's, there's a work to be done when I meet people I don't know. So that's why sometimes I'll, I'll break eye contact, I'll do stuff like that. I, I'm not trying to be rude. It's just like that particular sound in my room right now is very loud and it's like you know like you're listening to a music suddenly the guy blast the heavy metal right next to you it's gonna yeah. you're that guy so and you know guy, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so it, 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 it will feel like an aggression yeah right so sometimes that's what it feels like it's it's an it's an aggression to me on certain things so i've learned to have specific behavior based on certain situations right but that's not always good because it's a it's a facade right so what I'm learning to do is to be more open to our people and realizing that opening like that is not, uh, that, that it's okay, right? Yeah. So I doesn't mean I especially like it, yeah. uh, or I don't think I ever will, but I, I'm, I'm capable now of uh, being way more myself into a situation which fa makes it far less stressful. And so the conf to be more confrontational about stuff as well so that I don't have to stay in situations I don't want to be in. Yeah, because sometimes if you can, t you end up starting to you can absorb a little bit of that energy and you can carry it with you for a really long time. And for you, that yeah, becomes that, That's way I can't, I can't, I can't yeah. do that. So yeah, so like, you know, like you have toxic people or whatever, or like mm -hmm. people who don't like to be around, that feeling you get around them, yeah. it'll stick. Yeah. And it'll be very loud in my case, and I can't have that. So that's why I'm like, nah, I don't like you. So yeah. like, and, and I, I, I'm not, it's just, it sticks. Like it's, and it's very aggressive. So I'm like, no, I don't want that. So that's why you'll see me with some people. I'm like, nah, man. Mm -hmm. I don't, so normally you'll be like, yeah, I get, I get that feel from that person, but it's all good. Me, it's like, no, no, I don't, I, I can't. up my week, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, or at least my day. Yeah. Like, I, I'll take me a day to recover from, uh, from certain people or stuff like that. And so at some point now that I'm, that I'm older, I know I don't have to take it, then I don't. So I'm like, no, I won't socialize with you. But you have to understand, when you're a kid, you're pounded into doing it the normal way. Yeah. So you don't, you see. You're uh, not given, you were never given the tools to work with. No, but like by, nat by nature, like if you have less of a freeze button, that means you have a very strong sympathetic side. That's why you see autistic kids being so aggressive. So they're not violent. They just have, a, they're going to fight through it, which is the only reaction they. That, but that's the good yeah. reaction yeah. to have because yeah. there's no freeze. What you're asking uh, the kid to do is to put themselves into a freeze and accept the, and they, and they come because sympathetic. Like, no, no, I need to act. I need to. Mm -hmm conquer that particular thing. So they, are, they go aggressively at it, and then they're being pounded into, no, go into freeze. It, it's very, if you go into freeze, there's no freeze almost as an autistic person. That means that all that energy, instead of going toward you, who, who I felt you were uh, uh, attacking me, yeah. if I can't attack back, then that energy will come back in. Yeah. It's not gonna stop. So they think like, stop getting angry at the person. It's not that. Is that energy is going somewhere? Because and if it's not toward you, it's toward me. And they're trying to force them into a state with which they don't have access to. So that energy that should go toward fighting you, then will I'll fight myself instead. And yeah. so all that energy becomes extremely destructive inside. So instead of allowing me to be destructive with you, you're forcing me to be destructive with me. And that, that hurts a lot. And it's different as an adult, but as a child, that's, oh, the, that's the big issue. Yeah, and so, and what you don't know, because because you no don't one can exp no one can explain to you, especially when you have a bitch from hell as a mother and a coward as a father. Who so the bitch from hell decides to beat the shit out of you all the time because she doesn't understand yeah. your behavior, which at least that part I get. Uh, and the coward of the father just basically decide not to be there, right? Yeah. And not to deal with it. And so like yeah 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 everything is yeah. So everything my told show like yeah 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 you'll make it don't worry just basically I was told to suck it up and to do as I was told. That was mm -hmm. cool too. And that's why at 10, 12, I already told everybody to go fuck themselves because I'm like, no. I was no. gonna say, you don't seem to be doing a very good job doing what you're told. <laughs> no, no, that's funny that I worked for a while, right? And, but from the beginning, I was like, no, because there were certain things too, certain patterns. I was like, I'm, certain patterns I can see. I was like, that, no. And I need to be explained, to be explained why. I need to do things. That's the beauty of being who I am on a number of stuff is I need to understand why 
I need to do one. I need I need to understand intent. I knew that from the beginning. If you don't give me intent, I can't do anything. So if you give me a history lesson and don't explain to me the social ramification, and I'm eight, by the way, the social ramification of the Christian church within the or the Roman Catholic church within the relationship with the Nazi, I'm like, I don't. I don't give a shit about the date. I need to understand the relationship. I need to understand yeah. intent always, right? Since yeah. very, very, and so, like, shut up, suck it up, do as you're told, which is the same thing at home and everything. And for me, literally, it cannot be like that. And so, me, I wanted to be a, always a hyper, I'm a hyper specialist by being who I am, what I am, and it's like understanding human behavior. So I don't want to date. I want to know why G Nazi Germany. Explain to me why it happened. Now I know because I studied after school. Yeah. But back then, that Nazi Germany means 1939 means no. I mean, there's, so, but so everything was like that. Even from my parents, it was like do as you're told. You know, like a kid. And whoosh, yeah. so every day, different behavior. Didn't do well in school. So it was just pounding upon pounding upon pounding. Like not, just not getting it. It's like everything that doesn't come at you with a reason that you can understand immediately almost can feel like an attack all the time. But the problem is I don't understand people. Like, th there seems to be such a difference between people wills and people intent. Always. I think I, that's the way human beings are, unfortunately. I, don't, I so do not understand. Yeah. So that I'm always confused by people because I'm looking at them because I'm like, you're saying this, but you're doing that. Mm -hmm. you, your words go right, but your intent goes left of your actions. And I don't understand. So I, that, that makes... That's the part of socialization that is hard, is I talk to people and they use words that don't match their intent. And that, leave, that leaves me baffled all the time. And so that makes it sometimes hard for socialization. And I'm like, cause, so I, I hate small talk, as you can imagine. Yeah. But so when, when we start to go into conversation where I have people continuously uh, asking me what to do, but not, not following anything that I said or stuff like that, then I just shut off real fast. And so I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so like people think I don't care or whatever. It's like, no, I just don't understand what you're asking. I told you, you're not listening. I'm like, all right. So, uh, so that's mostly my interaction with people. I just don't understand. Yeah. Well, I still think, I think there's, like in your case, obviously this has been pretty valuable to you. Like as a... Extremely, I wouldn't give up for the world. Yeah. I think you're all crazy. I, I'm normal. Yeah. Uh, that's, but from the beginning, from a kid, I was like, it's not me who's crazy, it's you who's normal. Yeah. And what would, what would you describe as almost as the, as the opposite of this like hyper-specialized, very dialed in, um, in tune state that you live in? Like, what is the opposite of that? Well, like, for example, I was, um, so that's the typical, um, if you look from a genetic perspective, it would be the typical... Um, schizophrenia, there was actually a very interesting point about ADHD and what it means. I don't this think is it, exactly. ADHD is a complete bullshit stuff. Yeah. I don't think it's a, like the same thing, it's not a disorder, ADHD, mm -hmm. right? It's, if you look, so go back in that Neolithic village, right? You have the autistic kids who's going to uh, spend fucking 12 hours making a spear with banana leaves. Yeah. And it's going to be the best fucking spear ever, by the way. Mm -hmm. But he's going to take the stone and he's going to make it, per and then he's going to do this, right, and everything. But then, that, you can't just have, you can't have that kid in that village, right? I mean, you can have one, but yeah. how many can you, and how much, you have to feed him constantly because he's constantly working. He requires so much attention, right? Mm -hmm. like, imagine an autistic kid, how much attention that is for yeah. the parents. And you're gonna have to find what he's good at. And, but that's the point, in, in today's society, we can give the kid that much attention because it's one kid. So he's bigger, by the way. So autistic kids are born bigger, and there's an entire thing about that. But so, but in that village, I need a guy who's like, What's over there? Let's go find out. What's yeah. over here? Let's uh, uh, shaman, like, you know, oh, yeah, it's about... The, so, I mean, yeah. there's an entire behavior there where you need more of those people mm -hmm. in that village. See, it's interesting. You and I operate on just exactly like we described, the exact yeah. opposite yes. of that. You are a very... You can definitely specialize and focus, and you can dive into something and stay in it for... I, I mean, not just hours, but yeah. fucking weeks and months yeah. if you need to. Years, if I... The way that I work makes people fucking crazy. Like, I've done things where I'll set up. This is just as an example. I was cutting up some stuff for the, t making the stuff for the templates and cutting up some video stuff. Had maybe two hours worth of work to do. Um, I planned two hours, not probably two hours if someone would yeah. have just done it. But what I do is I set my computer up on the box, and then I set about 
five, ten meters away, around the corner, my nuts and some cheese and something to drink. And, you're, yeah. and I would do the thing. And as soon as I was like, and I'm fucking bored, and I'd go, and I'd grab something to eat, and I'd just walk, and I'd come back, and then I'm good to go. But that was like, I, I cannot work without a break. And the break, like just the separation from that focus is the only thing that I can pay attention to. It gets overwhelming to where I'm like, done. I'm just done. I got to be done. Yeah. And it's very, when you describe the way that things are for you, it is the exact fucking opposite of the way things so, are but, for me. See, but you, you can work on all that stuff. I cannot. You could just not even start with it. Yeah. I won't. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's why people were like, but I ask you to do this. And I'm like, and I told you I wouldn't do it. Yeah. This is my conversation with everybody. And my problem is I never get good at anything. I get okay at lots of things. Which is very necessary for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Right? But if you look at, um, like, people are like, see, a mentoring program, they send me stuff and they go like, oh, I'm trying to figure this. And then what do you think about that? And I'm like, I don't know because I'm not there yet. Yeah. I'm not just not doing it yet. And they're like, yeah, but what about this? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not there yet. And they're like, no, but can you look at it? I'm like, no, I can't. Yeah. Why? Because if I could look at it, I would dive into it, and then I'll figure it out. But I'm not there yet. Yeah. So I just, I'm not going to do it because I'm not there yet. And they were like, no, no, babe, just look at it and think about it. I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't because I'm not yeah. there yet. But so that's, but that's my entire childhood. Mm -hmm. It's like, do this. No, I'm not uh, there I'm yet. I'm not ready, yeah. And you, <laughs> well, you're not ready. What does that even mean? Like, you're going to do it because I told you. No. No, because I'm not there yet. And so... And then I get the shit beat out of me. Uh, but it was, I was just like, I can't do it. But if you f allow me to find something where I'm like, ooh, let me find, figure this out, then it's on. Yeah. And then it's on all day. Yeah. Every day, not stop. So th this is something that I. Because you can get tunnel vision in a good way very quickly and just. I'm go. always tunnel vision. Yeah. Just people don't understand. So uh, people, we, I read five books at always continuously so what I mean by that is I read one book I can stop one book pick up the next pick up the next and you know like when you read a book and you're inside the story mm -hmm. all right so I can do that with five books at the same time I'll stop there. one I go there and then I go into that story I take out it's like I have rooms in my head where certain things are being done and usually there's more than, there's a few going on at the same time so in that room I have this problem that keeps spinning until it's being solved then I have that room where that pro and then I'll do all those I'll have five six seven rooms going on at once where I just can go in any room and the problem is being solved there. I don't have to be there for the problem being solved because it is happening. Yeah. Right. So if I'm after a problem, I'll stay within it 24 hours a day. I'll dream about the stuff, but basically it's, const it's like a feeling that is constantly there. It's part of the music, if you want. There's yeah. a music playing in every room and that music is always playing. I don't understand not playing the music. I want to do that. So the music is playing, that's all. It's just the music is playing. So it doesn't need words, but that music is constantly playing. So right now I want to play pool again. So like my mind is going on to what is my next drill. And then I'm going to go, so what happens when I hit center cue ball with slightly left? And then that thing just spins and spins and spins. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's actually, it's, it's like meeting an old friend. It's like, hey, you know, like that comfortable yeah. feeling. That's what I get out of that all the time. But it's, so that, gives me a problem sometimes on the mentoring program and everything because I give them an exercise and me, I'll stay with an exercise for fucking three months. Mm -hmm. But that's all I'll, I'll do until I understand the exercise. Maybe not master it, but I'll understand. So there's a physical part, but also when I'm not thinking about it, I'm thinking about it. Like this, my body is getting ready to get better at that exercise. So it's not my mind who's doing it. It's my entire body. Like my nervous system is getting better at that exercise. So I'll do it until I realize, okay, I got a feel for it. When, I, when the music is beautiful enough, I'm good. Yeah. But this will happen until I get there. And so uh, dealing with people that are like, um, yeah, I kind of did it. I'm like, what does that mean? That means you're not done yet? You're not there yet. That's what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> so no, no, no. I went there and then I stopped. Said, what do you mean stopping? Like, you, you're not finished with it yet. Is that what you mean? Like, I don't understand not doing that because that's the only way I can do it. And so... But it's necessary for people to be able to do the shit that they don't want to do. It's just, I cannot. And so it cre can, can create a lot of very rough situations for me. If I'm put in a situation where there's something that I don't want to do, then it's won't, it won't get done. And that, that has led to very difficult relationship with people, especially women and stuff like that, where I was like, but you're not expressing this, you're not using words, and like, but I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm in love with you. That's all I do all day. Yeah. I, I, it's, uh, it's, you know, like uh, I being poor, I have only my dreams. I laid my dreams uh, at your feet, tread softly because you tread on my dreams.
-hmm. It's that's what I've done with some women in my life. It's like I've laid my feet, uh, my dream at your feet, and tread yeah, softly. And and, and, and the part of the issue is you tend to internalize a lot of that energy because it's just there all the time. But yeah, and I can't. And, 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 and externalizing times, is very hard. And especially in relationships yes. with people, especially the opposite sex, is. Somebody needs uh, it, to it's know. Reason, yes. They need to feel validated. And at least sometimes. now I can talk about it. But like for 20, 30s, he was there. He was continuing to analyze yeah. and he didn't want to let it out. I didn't, I didn't want to let it out. And so with relationship, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been very, very hard for the women in my life because yeah. uh, there's all that. So when I pay attention, I'm 100% there, which they mm -hmm. love. But when I'm not, yeah. So and, if, and, and it can almost come off as like dismissive or rude well, if extremely, they're not aware. Extremely. You know? No, because even more than that, because it's like the guy is like, no, I'm not there, which means if we had a fight or I got hurt or whatever, and then I'm like, you're not there, that means you're gone. And so mm -hmm. that that's extremely dismissive of people. I, I'm not trying. I, I'm not being dismissive, by the way. You're just not in the room right now. Yeah. Like, you disrupted the music. So there is no music in that room, so I'm not listening because there is no music. Until I put the music, certain music back in the room, I. There is no music, so I'm not listening. So I'm not constantly thinking as about you. So I don't have that constant um, a attention that I'm giving you. Plus, you have to understand everything that I do is based on that. So that means that I'm very good at very subtle stuff and understanding pattern in a certain way. So I can know, I know what people think. I know because I can I read the tiny signs. So people are used to me giving them that attention. And again, allowing them to be who they are. That's still my greatest gift, right? So yeah. I can do that to the women in my life. Like they were always in a... When I was 100% like with the communication open, right? It was like that guy who allows me to be who I am and, and can always like anticipate the stuff. So it's always a position where they're just happy and where, where they can be who they are, which makes them very free. That's a very addicting feeling, right? And then suddenly something would happen and then suddenly there's nothing. Mm -hmm. That can be extremely dismissive and probably very painful. And I, I did not do it on purpose, it's just like if the music isn't there, I, there's nothing for me to do. Like without music, I don't do anything. I'm just off. So what do you do now, especially because this realization has been, I mean, you've kind of always known, but it's pretty recent. I think the first I ever heard you talk publicly at was really right before or during the nervous system nutrition workshop you That's, did uh, um, a couple months ago. But you know, I, this is not a coincidence that it, ha that it happened after the nutrition started. I think the nutrition has changed me so much that it, that's what really allowed me to realize fully the, the autism stuff. Because it cleared up my nervous system so everything. much that it yeah. made certain things very obvious that were always obvious. I just couldn't pinpoint it because I had constant, I had a background noise. Yeah in my room constantly that were not letting me focus as I should. The nutrition has cleared the and background noise. And you didn't noise. notice that noise as different because it was just always there. No, plus I knew there was a noise. I just couldn't, what if, I just noise. can't shut it off. Yeah. yeah, there was nothing I could do because it was always there going like, I know that noise shouldn't be there. But I just don't know where it comes from. It's like, why is that noise there? I know it shouldn't be there. I just can't take care of it, can't get rid of it, can't make it shut up for more than five minutes. Yeah. So it was driving me crazy. That's my 20s. Yeah. Where that noise was constantly, the rage that I felt out of that noise being constantly there, ruining my symphony, was very hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then the nutrition cleared up the noise. And suddenly I'm like, well, like this. Yeah. And now I can focus. And so that has been the major change in my life, was actually the nutrition that allowed me to go toward understanding myself better. And so now it, the clarity in my room is so great that I was like, all right, so I'm going to do something with it. So back to playing pool, back to training a certain way, back to and doing more for strong fit. And so now I can do so much more because I stopped the fucking noise, that background noise that was in my room constantly. How do you take now your understanding of things and how do you take that into um, parenting your daughter now in a way that's not going to cause a similar reaction to the so, way that well, you... Well, that's the thing is uh, she's on the spectrum as well. Right, that's what they misdiagnose with the learning disability. It's not a learning disability, it's a behavior because she's on the spectrum as well. And so to me, what was very important, but that I knew from the beginning, was to find whatever she rocks her music. Mm -hmm. There's going to be that one activity that grips you. Right? So yeah. that you have to be on that autism to understand the importance of that. And if I can... And it's simple. It's always something... It's, it's, something, it's, it's a feeling. Always something, yep. So in her case, it was sliding. Mm -hmm. So when she was a kid, she didn't walk. She went from stumbling to running. I put her on a bicycle. She went... One, twice, took off. 
So not my best parenting ever because she didn't have a helmet or anything. I put, she's five. I put her on the bicycle. She went, huh, huh, took off, went around the, went around the building and started going like this around the, in the fucking parking lot everywhere. I was like, I wasn't ready. I thought she was like old kid. And now she just went, yeah. she likes sliding. So I tried to make her do strong fit stuff, to make her do MMA. Nothing gripped until she did ice skating. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yay. And now she's just obsessed about hockey because the skating is a sliding, sliding thing. Yeah. And so that's all she wants to do. So since she found that, she got better at school. She started to do other yeah. sports. She started to lose weight. She started to, because she found that one thing that allows her to go vroom. Yeah, and it's a physical sensation, yep. but it's, to me, the, what it's, and we've talked about this and before, the skill, the is, is the skill about yep. it really is in improvisation, which is in yep. you're getting in a thing and you're moving. It's very different than walking where you just go, all right, I'm going here. Yep. Like, like as, it, as you're going, mm -hmm. there's momentum and you're just required to move. And, and does that need to get really better at that? And that, 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 it's a jolt of adrenaline when you need to get better at something. It's mm -hmm. like sometimes I'm on the pool table, I'm like, I want to make that shot. It's like your entire body goes, yeah. Vroom. it's yeah. like that's really what you're made for. You're made mm -hmm. to be a fucking hyper specialist that's yeah. going to do that. You know, that, that black hole, that thing that gets, like all my energy gets, it doesn't increase, it, it actually gets mm -hmm. tighter and tighter until it's a point that is that small that it's almost like, it's so concerned it's a black hole. And that's why I feel my best is when everything goes, yeah. and it's everything on one thing. And for her right now, we're at a point. You're at a, you're at a point where we have a you have a big concept now. You think like the gliding, mm -hmm. the smooth thing is very yeah. connects to her very much, yes. right? And so then you start pointing your attention to other things that maybe fit that sensation, right? Like yeah, you feel exactly. like steering her towards something like like music or try to let her feel these things out. Where yeah. where then you can start. To, we, we found the wide thing that works, and then you can start to maybe. Let her find the thing that is really her thing. Then, within exactly. The, the problem is steering is you can't steer you can't, yeah. because it's like no, yeah, it's off. And you're like shit. Well, ha oh, no. uh, uh, it just what? has to be available. I so they go like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so you have to go there because there's not going to be anything else. Yeah. It's not going to be like honey. Let's because if you put you? ten things in front, you're gonna. It's just going to be no, 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 no. Like, and just let the. There'll be something where she goes, okay, and that's the one. That's the thing. Is So your job as a parent in that case is to try to find whatever that moment happens. Mm -hmm. Like to keep trying stuff. So that's the key is, so this is where we need more attention. Is we need, so. Because we can't take a kid growing up the way you grew up where it's not like you're non-functional. And, and, and start, paint, and start, and start way, yeah. painting them into corners as like, sorry, there's a problem. It's got a label. Go away. Yeah. Like, so the problem is they put me into one sport and then make, force me to do it. Because, you know, this is life. So you have to learn to suck it up and follow the rules. So the key is try all of them. Try one. Mm -hmm. Wait six months. Is it here? No. Move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. Even though you might try 32, but at some point, there's one who's going to hit that spot. Yeah. When that spot is hit, your kid will go like this, and it's on. And now mm -hmm. he'll, get the, he'll be fucking good at it. Yeah. But it's going to be that one thing. Where's the trigger? Why the trigger? I have no idea. But there's certain things that just, like, pull hooked me from day one. Mm -hmm. And it's impactful. It's, in my opinion... It changes that, your life. After well, that. and not just for the person, but for yeah. everybody else. You know what I mean? The mm -hmm. work, if you look at the work of people who, in the last 30 years, who you would describe as somewhere along the spectrum... It's probably some of the most important work. But okay, so Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. autistic, Ramanujan, the the mathematical genius. Have you seen uh, Goodwill Hunting? Yes. Yep. You know when they talk about the Indian guy, yep. uh, like uh, dot not arrows. In the, the, yeah. You know when Robin Williams talks to, yep. uh, they talk about that. He was a mathematical genius. They made a movie about him actually, but he yep. was a prime number genius who read a basically like a high school manual about mathematics and out of that came up basically with hundreds of theorems. Some of them already existed and other that never did. And he sent him to a guy in Cambridge in England who brought him to England going like, this guy is the greatest gen mathematical genius we ever had. Autistic. Mm -hmm. uh, a number, because that's what it takes to be that. Be that good at one thing. You're going to have to think differently. You're going to have to, because it's not about the worlds anymore. It's an entirely different processing power and I think to become great at anything and that's like those are all very specialized things but extremely to be, specialized but to be great at anything requires maybe a lack of 
balance in the rest of your skill set anyways? But they all, but that's what Asperger is. They're fucking socially, they're a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But the, the less socialization is more time to be good at that and everything. All the great mathematicians were autistic, or mm -hmm. I mean like the, the vast percentages and everything. But they're all guys that will spend like, you know, 16 hours a day doing that. But that makes you happy. The problem is for people don't see it as a balanced life because it's not balanced for them. Yeah, it doesn't but fit. you have to understand that balance is not doing everything at once. That's not balance. Balance is doing whatever you do to the greatest amount, and then something else, and then something else, something else. For me, yeah, whenever I, have to, you do, I do something, let me do that. Then I'll do something else to the most, and then that to the most. But while I do something, you have to let me mm -hmm. do that. If you stop me, like you interrupt me, it's physically painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah does that all the time to me. Dad, and I'm like, what? Because now that, that just like a, a bomb exploded in my room because yeah. I was like, I was listening to the music and doing something to like, mm, and that's where all that shit comes from. When this yeah. is in my room and you say dad or Julian, it's like it takes me out of mm -hmm. that music. And that's why sometimes you'll see me looking a certain way. It's because you took me out of that music and it's painful. And it's interesting it because it's taken me time, a couple of years, probably a year of a lot more time mm -hmm. with you, where a year and a half, where there's just finding even that balance in interacting with you. You know what I mean? There, there's, there is times when um, we'll get done doing something, and I just know I'm like Julian's done. Yeah, like, like, like you kind of, yeah. you know, we don't have to do the big goodbye thing, which is yeah. a very European thing, I might add. But, uh, but you know, it's just code on. All right, see ya, boom. And yeah. it's and that and now because I know already it's totally head. fine. Yeah, you're, yeah, but I, you're already on to the next thing, and that's yeah, I, okay. I, I'm all, yes, and I don't mean to be real. I don't want to do that. It's like, but I'm, I'm just. I'm doing something else. Like yeah. right now, there's something I want to do at home or whatever, and I'm there. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm like, yeah, bye guys. And then I'm gone. I, I, and again, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm just like. Well, and, and having understood the context of that now over time, yeah. it's, you can it's see not it. a thing. It's but not, if, but yeah. if you were to like be around a 10 people who have no idea who you are or anything like that, they'd be like, what the fuck? You yeah, just left. so that's where you'll see me make efforts. Yeah. So you just have to try. Even though it's maybe not, and, and I will because I don't mean yeah. to be rude or anything, but it's it's just it's um, uncomfortable or at least not. Um, I don't speak. It's not in, uh, my favorite music. Yeah, but I will. So that's why you'll see me when people do I don't it know. To just you have to person. be. So that's what you yeah. learn as you as you get older. Yeah. Is there is certain behavior you have to have in society, and so I'll be like, hey, and then you actually the more social you'll see me, the more I'm faking it. Mm -hmm. That's how you'll know. Usually when I'm comfortable, I'm quiet like this. If you see me being almost overly social, and yes, loud, and yeah. then that means I'm, um, it's not playing an act, but I am being that person. Like I'm, yeah. it's, it's like I need you're to, not a showman. No, but I need to no. take action yeah. to be able to socialize. I can do it in a quiet way because then I'm in my room. So then it's an action that I'm taking. Like I'm, I'm doing that, like training. Mm -hmm. I am socializing. All right, so let's socialize. Let's fucking do this. Yeah. And then I do, just like training, I'm like, let's do this and let's do this well. So now I make jokes and I make people mm -hmm. feel comfortable and I'll, take, I'll pay attention to you and I'll take care of you. That's what socializing means to me. It doesn't mean sharing. It means me taking care of you yeah. and making you laugh and, and all that stuff. And that, so that's why you'll see me. I'm just taking action because I don't know how to do it otherwise. That takes a lot out of you, doesn't it? Yes, though. that's why you'll see me after I get tired and fuck off. You know, especially when we have, you know, if we, we'll have, then there will be people here and, then, you know, we have people around all the time and sometimes it's, um, if we get a bunch of people around and we go out and eat after a long day or something, yeah. we can just tell at the end of the day, I was like, man, Julian is just going to walk straight fucking home. Like, yeah. like it, that it's work. Yeah. It is, it's not that it's not but, worth uh, it, but it's work. It's, it's work, hard. and it's not bad work, by the way. It's no. like the seminars. This is why I chose it, because I love the seminars. So th that's the key, too, is going back to the parents who are going to have to find all the sports, is we want to find it. Mm -hmm. It's just this is where we need help. It's, it's very hard to find those things on your own. I had to, yeah. but it's very, very hard to, because it's very hard, to, again, to socialize that way. So it's an effort every time. And so most of the time, you see people backing off, because even if you want to socialize, you just... It's very hard to put yourself in that situation, that aggressive. It, it is an aggressive situation. Yeah. It, not that it should be, but it is. And so imagine what it's like to walk for me, to walk to a woman that I don't know, to tell her she's beautiful. Yeah. It's the most aggressive thing ever. So Especially when, honestly, some, sometimes you have a hard time saying hi or bye to people you know. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. And that's, so, a, that's such a huge Yeah, people don't understand step. what it takes to go, hey. And so I, I have to, again, it's a certain behavior, but it's an action. So, but I, for example, I love doing the seminars 
But that's why I have such a hard time with the coaches week because it's six, eight people looking at me. Mm -hmm. The amount of pressure they put on me, they don't realize how aggressive it is to me. But a seminar is 20, 30 people. They're over there. I have an act, uh, a behavior that I have during the seminar that allows me to follow what I'm going to talk about. And I'm still socializing with them. It's a communication that I thrive with. When I go to Coaches Week and it's 10 people looking at me directly, it becomes far more aggressive. It's very me. personal too. And it becomes and very, yeah. so much harder. Yeah. And that's why I can't do Coaches Week anymore because I get drained so much. That is very, very, I can't do four days like that. I get drained and it gets physically painful for me to be drained like that. And we've talked about this in the past too. I think that's common for people who just, who coach even, is that mm -hmm. um, that handing over of energy. Like, so like, like, like I think smaller interactions for you are, are draining, but they, for, they drain for, for everybody. For, but for someone like yes. me, the, something long like like coaching and trying and yep. teaching and doing that all day and ha maybe having a lot of that energy maybe not returned all the time because it's just not the way it always works, right? And 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 that some really of it not. some of it just feels like you're just, uh, you know, uh, you and by the I, end of the day you're yeah. just like fuck. You know me, what I what compare is coaching to? I compare it to priesthood, right? Look, like it's you do this because you care, so you do mm -hmm. this out of love for. Mankind, really, you go into it and very quickly you realize that you're taking the stuff a lot more seriously than the people you're trying to help. The amount of love that you put into it is infinite and yet you get very little back. And you constantly have those moments where your faith is being challenged. And you have to find a very important why inside of you uh, in order to keep going through. And the longer you do it, the more disillusionized you become about people in general. I'm not talking about coaching, I'm not talking about priesthood. Yeah. I mean, and you sleep with your clients. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, not but me. It, not me. No, no, never be there. Nobody does. I'm not once or twice. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, but it's. Well, I guess my wife, I did. Never, oh, you coach your wife. Mind. There did, you yeah. go. See? I mean, not I, ever, I, I guess, not when I was coaching, she never left. Exactly. Me. <laughs> um, so, if you look, it's a lot like that, right? You put so much love toward the people. Because you want to help them, and the most crushing thing is when you realize they don't give a shit. Yeah. Or not nearly as much as you do. Yeah. Like, you want to see them do better than they do. Mm -hmm. That's what is so, that's heartbreaking as a coach. It has nothing to do with autism. We all go through it. Yeah. Like, when you care more about people's movement than they do their own, it hurts. Yeah. Right? And you have a gym, and you're putting so much into it. Right, mm -hmm. you, you try to make everything great and they come in and they fucking step everywhere with their shoes and then they <laughs> leave a mess there, they don't put the weights back and you feel betrayed because that love that you're putting into is not being returned. Yeah. And you, you could do so much more for them. You want to hand them salvation. That's what you're trying to do. It's like, look, I can make you so much better. Those problems I can fix for you, just talk to me, right? Have a relationship with me, talk to me. I can save you, I can bring all that to you. That's what coaching is, right? And it's, it's, it's like priesthood. And you, your faith is being challenged on a regular basis by people that don't seem to want to get better, that have been given all the tools and yet don't seem to care. And you see them fall and fall and fall again to the moment where sometimes you're wondering if mankind is fucked or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, that's what, and you feel like you're losing the war because you have more and more people that are out of shape and don't give a shit versus and people falling off the bandwagon constantly and coming back saying can i confess you my sins knowing full well that next week they're going to do exactly the same shit that's hard to take and if you look that's so we are in that sense and i do believe the gym is a, is a new church in the sense that we'll be able to help more people in gyms especially as society evolves the way it does than anybody else yeah. so in in that sense we are the new priests i mean but from a from a soul perspective I mean, like, look what we're trying to do. We're trying to get their nervous system, their nutrition. We're trying to get them to feel better about life in general, to find themselves. To those are all spiritual values in a way. Right? Yeah. But so I think those face crises are normal. I think it's you're gonna have to go through it. And but you see a lot of gym owners five years burn out and they quit. Yeah. I think that's what you see with the priest. Like, fuck it, I can't deal with people yeah. anymore. It's just never what you. It's not what thought you it was going to be, and that the the thing is, I still think it's worth it. Um, but it doesn't. But it doesn't mean it's easy. Um, so I think you have to go through that crisis at some point because then then you'll see. I think you come off come out of it stronger, and because, because it's reality. reality. Yes, 
That's why I think you come out of it stronger. So now I know what the reality of it is. Mm -hmm. The problem is what you don't know when no one tells you is that the first five years is going to be you making it to that reality crisis. Yeah. That's what the first five years of you having the business is. Not when you're just a coach because you're not paying the bills. When you have to pay all the bills, you're the last one getting paid. You make two grand a, a month for working fucking an hour away a week. You're cleaning the bathroom on Saturday at five for people that don't seem to give a shit. So it's going to take five years of that to, for you to hit that reality crisis. Yeah. And this is the moment where if you can keep on going, you'll come off stronger. And I see a lot of people quitting there because they're like, they're facing people get shattered in a way because then you realize how much work there actually is. By the way, no one ever told the priest that this was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. right? The problem with the fitness industry is we are being told that, yeah, open a gym, 100 people, 20 grand a month, yeah. you're making 10, you're coaching two classes. And so that's the problem is they go into it with that, with the wrong expectation of what being a coach or being a gym owner is. And that's where they get hurt. And five years in, they saw, I think they saw this drop because of where they started. Yeah. So before we wrap up, we had talked in the past, God, I hope you get this answer right, but um, about the thing that maybe you miss the most about actually like owning your gym. And even though like when people look back on a time when they had like no money and opportunities were like that always still seems to be a point where people still remember it fondly a little bit. What was the part that you remember that you maybe miss, like one part that you miss the most about owning your gym? Uh, the relationships was was a big one. Uh, me, I'd, especially the last two years, you know, I lived uh, in the gym, I lived upstairs. Mm -hmm. So it was like living on the farm. I would just wake up in the morning, come down, and it was that, so for me it was awesome, because like, it's that constant feedback loop yeah. of being in my gym and stuff like that. But it's, it's, the, it's the relationship and it's the, the feeling of making a difference in, in actual people's lives. Because the relationship means that I got, I got to see people and their family and I got to see firsthand the difference that I was making, not so much in my client's life, but in their overall family life and stuff like that. And it always made me feel like I was making a difference. Is it harder now because you feel like we're maybe two steps away from yeah. the people on the ground? Yeah. Yes. I feel like that's why the mentoring program is, I love it so much, is because I'm still, so those are coaches instead of clients, but those are, that's my tribe, those are, are my people, and I feel I can still make a difference on, but see the difference that I make. It's one thing to know that you're making one, but it's another to see it, right? Yeah. And I see, I have like four or five people, uh, I mean, more than that, but there's four or five, uh, you, you know them, stories out of the mentoring program where people have literally changed direction in their lives. Like you mm -hmm. can see it, like they, uh, we have Nick who like he went from almost quitting coaching to buying his own gym and being so happy right now. And then we, we have a bunch of stories like that. And at the end, that's why you do it. So mm -hmm. am I going to get all of them exactly the way I want? No, because that's a conversation I had with someone. He was like, he was looking at the bottom 10%. I was like, yeah, some of them will fall off after six months. But that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the five that I'll change. Yeah. If I change five coaches in my life, I'm good. And I think I have. So after that, whatever happens after, man, if I get to 10, awesome. But I've, I've done that. And so as much as I miss the coaching and the seeing people getting their lower back, so they're not cr you know, crying every morning because their lower back hurts and everything, that part I miss. But I did find some of it in the mentoring program because I've seen their lives change. Because they, the fire is rekindled, the fire is, of coaching is back there. And so I feel I've given them faith back in people, again, to the point where they want to coach again and then they, they find a new passion into it. And so that, that is by far the most, it's the only rewarding thing for me is that. Yeah. That's why I do it for. Is to, so yeah, some of them will do it just to know how to do the openers or mm -hmm. how to make people snatch more. That's, that's great, we all need that, right? But there's a few in there that will really, it will change the direction of their of their life and that's that's why I do it because it's it's always been about human beings for me because maybe it comes from you know like growing up the way I did always never uh, always misunderstood by almost by nature and I mean and stuff like that where I um, I want people to find themselves that's what drives me and so I've seen some where you can tell they found their color and they're happy like they had it the mentoring program and what we do has allowed them to find themselves and I guess that's a 
uh, compensation for my own childhood, I'm sure. But that was that's what matters to me. Like it's those it. moments. I like it. All right. We'll Thank wrap up on that. Thank you.